All right, glad you've joined us. Uh, if you, uh, if uh, we haven't met, I'm Josh, one of the pastors here at the church. We are in uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. We've been digging through uh, this chapter the last several weeks. This week we're uh, going to look at chapter, or verses 8 through 14, and that means we're skipping over verse 7 if you're very observant. That means uh, we're going to get back to that in a few weeks when we get to verse 17, they connect. So we're going to spend the next three weeks in this little section talking about how following Jesus means that you should expect that your life is going to include all kinds of sacrifice, all kinds of sac- I'm not talking about bulls and goats kind of sacrifice. I'm talking about, like if you recognize the treasure that you have in Jesus, you're going to be like that man in the scriptures who sold everything he had to buy that field, the one with the treasure. You guys know what I'm talking about, that guy, right? If you don't, don't worry, that's fine. What I'm saying is that if you grab onto Jesus and you're resting your hope on him and you're put, building your life on his promises, there are going to be things that you're willing to let go of. There are going to be sacrifices that you're willing to make. And this week, we're going to talk about the sacrifice of suffering with Jesus, okay? So let's read the passage. I'll make a few comments as we go, then we'll talk. Hebrews 13, starting in verse 8 this morning. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that might seem like it's out of place at first, but this is what grounds the rest of what he's about to say, okay? The reality is that Jesus is unchanging. He's not fickle. He doesn't, like, change his mind about you right? His rescue plan isn't going to change all of a sudden. You don't have to worry. There's not, there's not something you're missing. Like you, you're not going to have to come up with a new plan or do something more. He can be trusted to do what he says. Even though times change and circumstances change and cultures change, if Jesus never changes, God's grace never changes, the gospel never changes. Amen? Amen. Okay, so verse 9, don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulations, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate. He was rejected by his own people. By the very ones he came to save, he was put to death on a cross, and he was buried outside the city gates. You realize he suffered at the hands of both religious people and rebellious people, okay? But why was he willing to suffer? Why did he go through with it? Verse 12, therefore Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify his people or or to set us apart for our proper use, to make us holy and pleasing to God, okay? He might sanctify the people by his own blood, let us then, let, that's us, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city or a kingdom or a home here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Okay? Now, if you've been with us for a long time through this series, I bet you can answer this question. Do you remember who this letter was written to? It was written to Jewish men and women who had become Christians, Right? So they were getting heat from both sides. On the one hand, they're Jewish brothers and sisters who would not receive Jesus as Messiah, and instead, many of them were living to justify themselves before God by carefully practicing and observing the Old Testament laws and the rituals. And on the other hand, you have these Greco-Roman friends and neighbors who lived their lives quite a bit differently than the descendants of Abraham did, right? And so we've said before, there was animosity and there was pressure from both sides because following Jesus meant that these Hebrew Christians were going to be living radically different than everybody else. Sound familiar? Okay. Look at verse 9. He says, the writer exhorts them to avoid strange teachings, to stay away from doctrines and philosophies and teachings about life that are foreign to the gospel, to not get caught up in seeing and doing life Ways that are foreign to what he's been teaching them all through this letter about the truth of God's grace and how he's been teaching them that they've been invited to respond to how incredible and awesome Jesus is and what he's done and what he's promised. The ancient church father, Tertullian, is alleged to have said that uh, just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, so the gospel is ever crucified between these two errors. Okay? What errors? The two errors that he was referencing are in theological terms called legalism and antinomianism, okay? I know, big words, okay? Hang in there. Easy to understand. I like to refer to them as religion and rebellion, okay? Let me explain. 
there have always been three ways of responding to God. One is right down the middle, and there's two ditches on both sides, okay? There's following him, doing his will, and you can picture that as walking the narrow road. It leads to eternal life that Jesus talked about in Scripture, okay? It's either that, or there are two ways of rejecting him and doing your own thing, okay? Two errors. You can picture them as getting stuck in the ditch on either side of the road, okay? Religion and rebellion, okay? Of course, there are all kinds of doctrines and teachings that are foreign to the gospel, but in these two ditches, you can find all those strange teachings that will lead you astray and keep you from actually following Jesus and experiencing the kingdom, okay? Let's talk about those ditches. Ditch number one, real quick. Let's talk about rebellion first. Ditch number one, rebellion. You can reject God's grace, You can reject the gospel by ignoring God's word and living the way that you see fit. Can't you do that? I did that for a while. It's it's, it's avoiding Jesus by ignoring him and just, you know, doing it your own way. If you're in this ditch, you may not believe the gospel at all. You're just living life your own way, right? That's certainly one way to rebel. But there's another way that you end up in this ditch, and it may be that you have been brought up or you have bought into the strange teaching that either because you prayed a prayer or you were baptized or you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you got your get-out-of-jail-free card and so you've rationalized and given yourself over to the lie that you don't have to live the way that God is clearly asking you to live through His revealed Word. You've bought into the error that God just forgives you and loves you and accepts you the way that you are. Now, the rebellion ditch is filled with people who are chasing after security and worth and fulfillment and the temporary pleasures of this life. And people in this ditch are stuck, and we've called them roundabouts of stupidity before, right? Because, uh, you know, they chase after created things to give them what they hope for in this life, hoping that they will save them. In the end, or by God's grace, sooner than later, they'll discover, like everybody else does, that created things ultimately can't deliver the goods, right? Right? So if you've heard the good news about God's grace, if you're claiming to follow Jesus, don't be led astray by these strange teachings. Rebellion is foreign to the gospel. In the words of Paul to the church at Rome, Romans 6, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it, Paul says. Verse 12, he says, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and don't offer any parts of it, your body, to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but you're under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not, he says. Paul says that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be serious about dealing with your sin. You just can't continue to ignore or reject what God has said about how to live and just live how you want to live. You can't do that. The German pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, right? And in it, he called this cheap grace. Cheap grace. Because if you're hanging out in this ditch, he said, you want the benefits of following Jesus without the cost, without the sacrifice, right? It's like, if you think that it's possible for you to have Jesus as your Savior, but not as your Lord, that's foreign to the gospel. You've been led astray. The gospel is the invitation for you to actually be set free from the curse of sin to follow Jesus. Okay? And that includes to repent and to actually walk in his ways. Now that's a ditch on one side, re- rebellion. But there's a ditch on the other side of the road. It's called religion. And uh, you can also reject God's grace. You can reject the gospel by embracing and obeying his word so as to justify yourself and to earn your salvation. Okay? Religion is man attempting to make ourselves right with God. The problem is that people in this ditch, those who reject the gospel in in favor of some system of morality, well, well, they often look as if they're trying to do God's will. Look like pretty good people on the outside, right? But in reality, religion is avoiding Jesus by developing your own moral goodness and presenting it to God as an effort to show him that he owes you, right? That's what it is. Religion or moralism, maybe that's a better term for it, uh, says that we can live a holy, uh, we can live a, a, a good, um, pleasing life on our own, right? The problem with that is, in order to be accepted to God, the problem with that is uh, you're not seeking God for salvation. If, if, if you're seeking to be right with God through your own morality or through your own religion, you're not seeking Him for salvation. You are using God as a means to achieve your own salvation, Okay? 
and at, at the level of behavior, like you may be doing things that are very sacrificial, right? You may be sacrificing time and money and, and all kinds of things to help the poor or to love your family or to be good and faithful to God's law. But at a deeper level, you just might be behaving in this way so that you can put God in your debt, right? Or so that he will bless you or, or so that you can think of yourself as a virtuous and charitable person, right? Ultimately, that's using God to get what you want. Answered prayers, good health, uh, prosperity to avoid hell, right? All kinds of things. And the truth of the matter is, apart from being in Christ, there's not one day that goes by that you please the Lord. You realize that? The ditch of religion is filled with people from every world religion. Every world religion. But it's also filled with a lot of professing Christians. And I'm telling you, this ditch is filled with a lot of good people. Good, good people. Even, well, grumpy people sometimes, right? <laughs> Often judgy and proud people, right? Good, moral, legalistic people who believe that they're going to be justified by God based on how good they do. Now, they may not even say it with their mouth, but these professing Christians believe in their heart that, Jesus, that salvation equals Jesus plus something. Jesus plus being good. Jesus plus saying the rosary. Jesus plus not eating meat on Fridays during Lent. Jesus plus praying to dead saints. Jesus plus knowing the Bible enough, giving enough, serving enough, you know, following the rules enough, being holy enough, doing penance enough, praying enough. Their hearts do not acknowledge that it's Jesus plus nothing that equals everything. Okay? Believe it or not, people who are living their lives trying to justify themselves by some standard, by some moral standard or some religious standard of practice, they're rejecting the gospel. They're rejecting the gospel. If you've heard the good news about God's grace, if you're claiming to follow Jesus, don't be led astray. Religion, moralism, is foreign to the gospel. This time, I want you to listen to Paul's words to the church in Galatia. Here's another church that Paul wrote to. What did he say to them? Galatians 3, you foolish Galatians, he says. Who has cast a spell on you? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by wor the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Were you saved by actually being a good person? Or was it because of you believed in what Jesus did? Verse 3, are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? And he goes on in verse 10, he says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written... Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. You guys know anybody who's done everything written in the book of the law? Anybody? I don't think so, right? Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse, verse 13, of the law by becoming a curse for us, you see. You understand what that means? It means that you don't have to perform in order to justify yourself before God. You don't have to do it. You can't get over yourself. His standard is perfection. And that means you'll never make it over the bar. You're listen, Jesus is the only one who ever has. And listen, he did it for you. He did it for you. He's the only one who got the A plus, you know, for living a life to the glory of God. And he's willing to make a great exchange for you, with you. He'll take your F and he'll give you his A plus, Right? Now, I know you don't deserve it, and I know it doesn't make any sense why he would do that for you. That's grace. That's why it's so amazing, right? If you will not accept that in your gut, right, there's this broken part of you that's just going to keep on trying and keep on striving and keep on performing and keep on pretending when you fail, right? And the writer of Hebrews says that those who try to justify themselves like that by being religious and moral, what does he say in verse 9? We just read it. He said, those who try to establish their hearts by this external behavior, by working hard to be good, he says they have not benefited. They haven't benefited. It's not doing them any good. They're not experiencing the rest, the joy, the fullness of the life that Jesus has promised, right? They're not experiencing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They're missing out on the kingdom. So let me just say this one more time to make sure that I'm clear, uh, I've been clear about it with you. If you're following Jesus, if you're responding to the gospel, uh, with repentance and faith and joy-filled obedience. That, that's the narrow path, right? Being a Christian has nothing to do with you developing a righteousness that you give to God so that he owes you. It's God growing you, giving you, and growing in you the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. 
Okay? This is the only way that your life has changed forever. And there's two major ways to hijack that good news okay, of God's grace to you in Jesus Christ. Two ways to hijack it. One is to reject the good news and attempt to do it, on your, do it your own way, rebellion. The other is to add to the good news and thereby wreck it, religion. Okay? The writer of Hebrews says, don't be led astray by these various kinds of strange teaching. They're foreign to the gospel. And if you notice in the text, he actually explains what it looks like to respond to the gospel and to stay out of those ditches. Okay, on one side, to the religious folk, he says, those of you living in an, with an external religiosity, like if you, you have Jesus plus a, a checklist spiritually, to those in the religion ditch, the writer says, no way, man, no way. Don't set your heart on external behaviors and practices that you can use to try to justify yourself to God. He says in verse 8, your heart needs to be established in grace. It needs to be rooted, anchored in grace. For you to be rescued from the curse of sin, it's by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. And not only are followers of Jesus saved by grace, we are fueled by grace and driven by grace and strengthened by grace and held by grace. Amen? Amen. On the other side, to those who are living with this false freedom, well, you're judging me. I was baptized. I'm forgiven. I can live how I want, right? I still believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, so what's the big deal? right? Well, to those in the rebellion ditch, the writer says, no way. Verse 12, Jesus suffered outside the gate so that he might what? Sanctify you. So that he might sanctify, so that he might set you apart, that you would live holy and pleasing to God. In other words, it's like, yo, hold up. Like he didn't just suffer for you so that you could just get forgiveness and blow him off and live however the heck you want. Jesus suffered everything he did so that you would follow him with joy-filled obedience that glorifies the Father and, re- and it just reflects how incredible and awesome Jesus is. He died to make you different than the rest of the world, to make you holy and loving and radical and risk-taking, captivated by another destiny than this world has to offer. So he tells us how to stay out of those ditches. It's God's grace alone, right? He suffered to sanctify you, to change you, You can't stay like you are if you're following Jesus. So he tells us how to stay out of the ditches, but then notice what else he does. He encourages us to strengthen our backs and to bear up under the reproach. This is what I'm I'm talking about. You ready? The cost and the sacrifice that comes with being a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? If you choose to walk the narrow road and stay out of those ditches, if you live and believe in grace alone, you're going to be too loose for the moralists. You're going to be too rigid for the rebels. Okay? People who follow Jesus do not fit in, and you better expect to deal with misunderstanding and animosity and pressure and, pr- and reproach from both sides. Okay? The world chose Barabbas over Jesus, right? Did they not? Yep. Followers of Christ should not expect to be winning popularity contests. Okay? How does the writer say that? Look at it in verse 13. He says, brothers and sisters, let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his disgrace, his reproach, his suffering, okay? For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one that is to come. Now, if we understand that Jesus suffered at the hands of both the religious, right? Those in the religious ditch and those in the rebellious ditch, both of them, right? Since Jesus suffered like that outside the camp, he was rejected by both groups and he was left to die outside the city, This is where we must be willing to go to identify with him, to be willing to be rejected by men. I can see how sometimes we're embarrassed to be identified, you know, with other professing Christians because there are a lot of people who just don't get the gospel who claim to know Jesus. I get that. But listen, if you really knew Jesus, I don't think you'd be embarrassed to identify with him. I really don't. If we understand that the city that's to come that the kingdom that Jesus has made available, like that's the one that matters, the one that will last. We're going to be willing to stop trying to make our private lives paradise on earth, okay? If we understand that he's where we find our worth, he's where we find our security, if we're going to experience his goodness and his joy in this world, we're going to have to have the courage to go to him outside the camp and bear his disgrace. In other words, we're going to have to be willing to suffer for being different for staying out of the ditch and actually following Jesus. Wow. I hate to tell some of you this, but following Jesus is never going to be cool. Never going to be cool. If we're following Jesus, we're always going to have a sense that we're not at home in this world. Okay? When these Hebrew Christians left Judaism to follow Jesus, they were considered traitors. Do you realize that? 
That's what he's writing to, to these guys. They were disowned by their families. They were heaped with shame, okay? They were willing to sacrifice and suffer for the treasure they found. That's what he's trying to do to encourage them all the more, right? Some of you have experienced that when you came to Christ in different ways. Following Jesus is never going to be cool. It's one of the errors of the seeker church model, trying to attract people to Jesus by convincing them how cool he is. Listen, the reason Jesus is attractive is because he willingly gave up every bit of his coolness to rescue and love the uncool, right? That's the truth. He's attractive because of the way that he sacrifices and loves and pours himself out and comes after broken, undeserving, uncool people like you and me, okay? There was another church in the New Testament at Corinth, and uh, they were having a little bit of trouble figuring this out. So Paul wrote to them, and he said this, if I could paraphrase, he said, to those who are being saved, he said that followers of Jesus are like the aroma of life, a life-giving perfume. They smell so good, right? But to those who are perishing, he said, we are the, str- the stench. We are a dreadful smell of death. You know what that means? You know why that is? Because on a whole, people don't like to be told that they're not good and they never will be good enough. Right? Right? P- people don't like to be told to- that they need to repent, right? I mean, I'm saved. I don't even like it. You need to repent. You need to get out of my face. Right? <laughs> right? Hopefully, I'll come back to you later. <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry for... Thanks for getting in my face, right? I, I just want you to think about this, loved ones. Like, if you're following Jesus, he's sent you on this mission. He's rescued you from the curse of sin and sent you on this mission to declare with your life and with your mouth these two things, repentance and forgiveness of sins. Isn't that what he said in the New Testament? That's our message. That's all we got. That's all we got. In the words of Jesus, repent and believe. That you get the kingdom, Okay? And that's the invitation. And to those whose ears and eyes are veiled to the truth, it's going to be unbelievably offensive. Yes. You're probably going to be uncool. Okay? First Peter 4, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Do you believe that? Yes. But to those who are being saved, those who are being saved, to those who the, the Holy Spirit is lifting the veil from their eyes, it's going to be life-giving to them. Like you, you make the gospel, either way, you make the gospel attractive by the way that you sacrifice and you love and you pour yourself out and by the way that you're willing to suffer because you have found a greater treasure in Jesus Christ, right? Now, I'm afraid that what was true in Jesus' day is just as true in ours. John, John 7, John said that uh, nobody was talking publicly about Jesus because they feared the Jews. That's what he said. They feared getting kicked out of their, the synagogue and shunned by their own families. Don't we fear things like that? like sarcasm from our parents, being ridiculed on social media. Don't we fear being that guy or that, that girl who's lame because, you know, you're not participating in the worldly pleasure rituals that maintain your popularity, right? We fear being left out and not invited, and so isn't it the same for us as it was for them? Aren't we tempted to compromise and to, to live how the world lives and to act how the world acts and to think how the world thinks and to do money and sex and relationships like the world does so that we don't have to suffer with him? We live in a world where, listen, people in this ditch and this ditch, they're consistently throwing fireballs at each other and anger, there's anger and misunderstanding and judgment and disgust with each other. It's it's constant, okay? And for the follower of Jesus, like if you're not on board with the lifestyle and the perspective of the worldview of the people in one ditch, if you're not adopting and assimilating to their attitudes and their, or their priorities, most of the time, they'll write you off and they'll misunderstand you and they're just going to assume that you're in the ditch on the other side, right? And so the writer to the Hebrews says, hey, you're not alone. You're not alone, Christian. Like, this is the way it's going to go in this broken world. Verse 14, he says, we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one that is to come. You and I are not home, in other words, right? We are citizens of another kingdom. That's what he's been preaching all through this book, right? Jesus is our home. We're resident aliens in the kingdom of this world. Until he returns, we're going to live outside of the world's approval. And I understand that's easier for some of us to take than others, right? We will bear the shame, the same treatment that he endured. He bore our shame and he suffered our wrath. So we go to him outside the camp by having the courage to identify with him, by following him and walking in his ways, even if it means we suffer. 
Now, Peter, he, you guys know Peter, right? He was the one who caved in and denied Jesus. He was not willing to suffer the night that Jesus was arrested. Remember that? Don't we all blow it? Don't we all fail to do this? Like, man, I regret being an idiot when I did that, right? And Peter, Jesus came to him, and what did he do? Oh, way to go, idiot. Nice job. Way to suffer for me. Is that what he did? No, what did Jesus do to Peter? He reinstated him. He said, I love you. I love you. I love you, right? That changed Peter's life. Look, listen to what he wrote in his letter later. 1 Peter 2, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles, he said, we're not going to fit in with anybody in these ditches, to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, that's people who don't know Jesus, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Okay? He goes on and he says, listen, submit. Verse 13, verse 16, submit. Verse 17, honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Submit even to people who don't deserve it, he says. Like, listen, that's not going to make you fit in in this world. For darn sure. Verse 20, for what credit is there when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it. But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor from God. This brings favor with God. I'm trying to get you guys to understand this morning. I'm not sure on a scale of 1 to 10 how, how, far you, how close you're with me. I'm trying to get you to understand it's going to cost you to believe the gospel and to actually respond to God's grace and live for Jesus. Okay? To follow Jesus, you, you pick up your cross. It could cost you friends. It could cost you popularity, approval, acceptance. It could cost you worldly success. It could cost you respect. It could cost you fitting in having things that other people have. There are boundaries that you set with sex and pleasure and what you do with your money and what kind and how much you entertain yourself with, right? Convictions based on God's word that you have on what you choose to do with your time and your talents and your treasure, on who you serve, on who you stand up for in the lunchroom, right? On how you refuse to laugh at that joking that is tearing someone else down, on how you refuse to play the social media game to get the likes or to get invited to the party, following Jesus is never going to be cool. Peter goes on in verse 21, for you were called to this. You were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Listen, he did not commit sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. That's the difference between him and us, by the way, right? He was perfect. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, his heavenly father. He knew who was in control. He knew what time it was, right? Jesus lived hard. He was betrayed, hated, and abandoned. He lived a very difficult life, and he felt the weight of being tempted to compromise and take the easy way out to do it his way, just like we do. Why? Why did he do that? We talked about it back in Hebrews 4. He had to be like his brothers and and sisters in every way, so that he could help us bear the weight. Remember that? One of the reasons that Jesus suffered is so that when you find yourself in a place of suffering, he can say to you, I know, I know, I get it, I get it, I see you, you, you can take it, you can take it. Listen, he, he's, the writer of Hebrews says, since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He's able to help them. Jesus took on our human nature so that he could experience the suffering that you and I face in this life, so that he's able to sympathize with us, and listen, so that he's able to help us with the ways that we're tempted when we suffer. He can help us. He can help us. Following Jesus means responding to the gospel, living a life of repentance and faith and joy-filled obedience. People who follow Jesus don't fit in, and you better expect to deal with misunderstanding, animosity, pressure, reproach from both sides. You're going to be tempted to compromise. You're going to be tempted to jump into one of those ditches, okay? But listen, you should also expect that Jesus will keep his promises to you. He is, if, if you're his, he's at work in your heart. And he's sent the Holy Spirit to empower you and to fuel you and to remind you what's true and to strengthen your back, to carry the weight, and to give you the grace to be able to sacrifice whatever it is because you believe and you know in all your heart you have a greater treasure. You have a greater treasure. Towards the end of his letter, Peter gives us this encouragement. He says this in 
1 Peter 5, he reminds us first to be, to be sober-minded, to be alert. He says, your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. He's looking to devour you. He's waiting to devour you. Verse 9, he says, resist him. Resist him. Firm in the faith. Know what's true in this life. Knowing the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. You ain't the first person to suffer for the name of Jesus. You won't be. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore. He'll restore you. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. And he will support you after you've suffered a little while. Just a little while. Right? So yeah, there's a cost. Yeah, there's a sacrifice. A willingness to suffer when you choose to follow Jesus and walk in his ways and when you resist the temptation to live your life in one of those ditches. But it's temporary. And God himself will come to your rescue. And the reward blows away the cost every single time. That's what we sing about on Sunday morning. I'm pretty sure. And personally, I remember it. I still remember it to this day. For me, although it was like 20 years ago, one of the first significant times that I drew a line in the sand and out of a conviction of believing the truth about God's grace, I was going to follow Jesus even though I knew it would cost me. And by God's grace, I was ready to make that sacrifice, and I did. And my friendships changed. The people who had my back, the people who made me feel valued and loved, and I was scared to let go, and I felt like I was probably going to be alone. But listen, for the first time, I remember letting go of those things that I had my identity and my security wrapped up in before Jesus. And you know what? When I look back over these last 20-some years of walking with Jesus, this scripture right here has become so real to me. In the words of Mark, follower of Jesus, chapter 10, verse 29, Truly I tell you, Jesus said, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more, now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. You hear that? God's faithfulness and goodness now. That's what he's promising. And the kingdom forever. Like, who would turn that down? Who would turn that down? Can I simply say this? That the one who has already given you his son, he's already promised you every bit of what you lay down, what you sacrifice for the sake of identifying with Jesus, it will be made up for a hundred times. You don't believe that this morning, do you? It's going to be made up for a hundred times. There are worldly things, created things, good things that even you, you, you have the tend, tendency to make ultimate things. Those are the things that you need to have the courage to be willing to let go of if you're going to grab on and follow Jesus and walk in his ways. And if you're going to experience the security and the fulfillment and the joy of the kingdom that he's made available to you. And the bottom line is this. Nobody is ever going to suffer for Jesus on earth and complain about it in eternity. Nobody. John Piper reminds us of this in his book, Don't Waste Your Life. Love that book. He says... Uh, he talks about this Calvary road, this road of sacrifice, this road of being willing to suffer, to identify with Jesus. It's walking the narrow road. It's, it's responding to the gospel. He says, hey, this is the road to joy. This is the road of joy. Listen to what he writes. All the riches of the glory of God in Christ are on the Calvary road. All the sweetest fellowship with Jesus is there. All the treasures of assurance. All the ecstasies of joy all the clearest sightings of eternity, all the noblest camaraderie, the deepest felt friendships, right? All the humblest affections, all the most tender acts of forgiving kindness, all the deepest discoveries of God's word, all the most earnest prayers, they are all on the Calvary road where Jesus walks with his people. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. On this road, in this road alone, life is Christ and death is gain. Life on every other road, or we could say living in every other ditch, is wasted. Amen. Wasted. Amen. I want to ask God this morning that he would help us to believe that before we worship him again. Would you pray with me?